observe that the Saraj Foundation is a public policy think tank which was established several years ago. Uh, it's part of our research mandate is to work and research on issues pertaining to urban renewal, sustainable development, youth development, public health, education and international relations. In the realm of international relations, uh, our foundation has been uh, pursuing research activities that would uh, enable the establishment of very cordial and good neighborly relations with our neighbors. Our activities are primarily focused on encouraging people-to-people -people contacts between India and Pakistan and India and China particularly. Uh, we have instituted several initiatives such as the Mumbai Karachi Friendship Forum, Ji uh, Xiang Ling Center for India-China Relations. As part of our initiatives in the realm of international relations, we regularly host public lectures by uh, several distinguished individuals to enable knowledge sharing and foster public uh, discussion on very pressing issues concerning international relations. Uh, carrying forward this tradition, we are very pleased to host another distinguished media expert in our institute to talk on a theme that continues to be discussed within and outside India. Uh, within the realm of international relations, India's foreign policy is one of the most important uh, themes that is often deliberated, at times contested and uh, critiqued. Especially since the disintegration of the Soviet Union, uh, our foreign policy has become more dynamic in nature uh, and substance. Its scope has expanded substantially over the past few years and the focus has shifted from a more security-centric worldview to greater emphasis on broadening our economic engagement with the rest of the world. Moreover, at the structural and institutional level, uh, our foreign policy making has also undergone a dynamic change. Uh, if you look at the stakeholders that are involved in foreign policy formulation, uh, you can see more participation from private sector, international and national uh, think tanks, academia and universities and the Indian diaspora, of course, in shaping very critical aspects of our foreign policy. Uh, with the advent of uh, new leadership in government with each uh, successive elections, our foreign policy has also witnessed an element of continuity and change. By continuity, I imply how despite uh, changing, shifting geopolitical circumstances, the philosophical underpinnings of our foreign policy have uh, continued to follow from the rich uh, sources of thoughts and uh, historical experiences as uh, Dr. Apana has very elaborately mentioned in her book. Uh, change in a way that with each administration you can see new energy, thought process and dynamism that is brought to the table. If the, for instance, if the Nehruvian era emphasized on maintaining a strategic uh, balance in a bipolar world order, you could see uh, Srimati Indira Gandhi's uh, administration focused more on security uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, if you look at Rajiv Gandhi's technology-driven uh, foreign policy, you can see uh, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee and Manmohan Singh's uh, era uh, giving a, striking a very unique balance uh, in our promoting our national security interests as well as our economic engagement. To highlight more on the evolution of our Indian foreign policy, its philosophical underpinning, the role of individuals and the nature of in institutions that go into foreign policy formulation. We have with us Dr. Aparna Pandey. A short introduction, uh, Dr. Aparna Pandey is a research fellow and director at Hudson Institute's initiative on the future of India and South Asia. She completed her Masters of Arts in History from one of the most prestigious institutes in India, that is St. Stephen's College. The University of Delhi. After obtaining her master's, she pursued her MPhil degree from the School of International Studies in the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Further on, in 2004, she completed her PhD from the University of Boston, where her dissertation focused on a very interesting theme that is explaining Pakistan's foreign policy, Escaping India, which was later published as a book by Rutledge in 2011. Dr. Pandey has written numerous journal papers, articles and op-ed columns in reputed international and national forums. Ma'am, it's a privilege to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give her a long... I must add uh, to my colleague Sanket's uh, welcome remarks, a very important point. Uh, friends, we also have in our midst Aparna's parents, Kamal Pandey, Shumati Pandey, 
and her brother Chaitanya. And Kamal ji has been uh, one of our most distinguished uh, civil servants. He's occupied very high positions in the government of India, Home Secretary, Cabinet Secretary. And I had an opportunity to work uh, with him when I was in the PMO during the Atalji's time. And the presence of Aparna's brother here is very significant because uh, this book she has dedicated to her brother Chaitanya and uh, their proud father and mother quipped that Raksha Bandhan is uh, approaching and this is sister's gift to the brother. Um, I would like to start by thanking Observer Research Foundation, especially Dr. Kulkarni, uh, Sanket, uh, Dhawal, Ami, and everybody else who has helped uh, put together today's event. I'll offer a brief overview of my of my book, um, and then um, I'm happy to take any questions or comments from the public. Every country's foreign policy has an underlying paradigm that explains what has influenced its, foreign, its policy and why that country takes the stand that it does. This paradigm is the product of the nation's history and its view of self. Leaders, especially those in premier positions for long periods of time, also shape how a nation sees itself. I argue that, with some variation, India's external relations have shown remarkable <coughs> continuity and consistency since independence, notwithstanding changes in leaders and ruling political parties. India is not alone in such constancy. Most countries base their foreign policy on a template shaped by their collective national experience and sense of self. Indians take pride in the fact that India is a 5,000-year-old civilization, even if its modern incarnation is only a 70-year-old state. Modern India's founding fathers, Jawaharlal Nehru being the most significant, sought to craft policies that would incorporate both India's historical legacy as well as its future geopolitical ambitions. My book is an attempt to explain to the world what are the ideas that influenced India's foreign policy, the individuals who left their mark, and the institutions that played a role in shaping it? The worldview of any nation is not and cannot be monochromatic. Examining India's foreign policy unveils what I identify in my book as four key strands in India's worldview. Realism, messianic idealism, imperialist legacy, and isolationism. Messianic idealism reflects the mantra of global peace, justice, prosperity. It has served as a strong moral component of India's foreign policy. Inspired by the legacy of ancient Indian thought, reiterated during the national struggle under Mahatma Gandhi. Proponents of this belief believe that India is an example for the world, and that India has a duty to proclaim that example for other nations. At the same time, Indians have had no qualms in anchoring external relations in realism. From ancient times, realist and idealist philosophies have coexisted in India, and the post-independence era is no exception. The Indian state has a Hobbesian view of the world, that India can only depend on itself. The imperial legacy or school of thought derives primarily from the most recent pre-independence experience under the British Raj. For this outlook, India is the center and Delhi knows best. India's post-independence policy towards its immediate South Asian neighbors exemplifies this. Delhi, whether under the British or after, has always believed that India's central government is best suited to make security decisions. While desirous of playing a role, India has been reluctant to be drawn into global issues. 
or ideologies. There's a streak of isolationism in India's global outlook. It is one of the many paradoxes that India wants to be seen as a great power and is still reluctant to do what is required of most great powers. It does not like military alliances or deploying force beyond its borders. Until the advent of the British Raj, with the exception of the ancient South Indian Chola dynasty, no other Indian empires sought to extend themselves outside the Indian subcontinent. As I mentioned earlier, India's foreign policy paradigm derives from its civilizational heritage. This Indian exceptionalism has its roots in history. And under the influence of founding fathers like Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, the average Indian believes that India was special, is special, and will always remain special. The influence of ancient India's most famous philosopher Chanakya lies in the way in which India has sought a system of layered relations coupled with the mistrust of most nations, the core of Chanakya's Mandal theory. Chanakya explains why, despite close relations with Western countries, India still maintains ties with Russia, old friends in the developing world, and is an active participant in groupings like BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Ancient philosophers also taught that the subcontinent was one civilizational and geographical entity. So India's outlook on its immediate neighbors is influenced by the Indian view that these countries are an integral part of India's civilization. Although the ancient Indian strategists and Indian empires were aware of the world around them, it was only under the Raj that India found itself connected strategically to a neighborhood beyond the subcontinent, spreading from the Gulf to Southeast Asia. The colonial experience left a mark on India's collective personality. More than seven de decades after independence, seeking freedom from external pressures is as much at the core of India's relations as it was when India was a colony. This pursuit of an independent path is also tied to a certain moral certitude that India ought to be a beacon, not only for Asia, but for the entire world. To create this idealized world, India championed non-alignment, encouraged multilateral cooperation through United Nations, other regional organizations, supported decolonization, disarmament. Modern India expects its neighbors, as I mentioned, to consider India as the key player or the Chakravartin. And South Asia is the only region where India has been willing to send its army or use force to defend its interests. Yet, as ancient philosophers noted, the Chakravartin asserts primacy but never takes over territory. Growing Chinese presence, however, has made Indian leaders aware that managing a sphere of influence is not only a function of telling others what to do, but being able to expend resources that deny space to your competitors. India's economic policy has enabled India to deploy economic tools in managing national security, maintaining international influence. For years, however, India's leaders and governments did not accord economic foreign policy the same priority. In the international arena, India saw world's major powers as unwilling to cater to the interests of previously colonized poor countries. A global order that allows international organizations to simply echo the desires of Western powers would be too reminiscent of the colonial era. Hence, India's demands for reforms, not only in UN Security Council, but also on the international economic order, the IMF, World Bank, and other organizations. In 1947, there were three and a half million persons of Indian origin in the British dominion in colonies. As of 2015, there are 27 million people of Indian origin, including temporary migrants, with the mass majority in the Gulf and the Western countries. India receives annually $70 billion in remittances, the largest for any expat group. This vast diaspora extends from Africa and the Americas to Australia and Fiji, and is now considered an asset for India's influence. However, for years, the Indian government 
ignored this asset. It's only recently that they have decided to tap into this diaspora. My book also examines in details the various institutions and the workings of these institutions. The Prime Minister's office, the pri various Prime Ministers over the years, the National Security Council, Parliament, the Ministry of External Affairs, and the Foreign Service. I have also described the key pillars of Nehruvian foreign policy and the style and substance shifts over the decades. Beginning with history, I end with analyzing the new nationalist internationalism of Prime Minister Modi and what it might mean for India. Mr. Modi, in many ways, resembles the first Indian Prime Minister in his zealous focus on foreign policy. In his, la in his first three years, Mr. Modi has traveled to over 50 countries. The Modi doctrine, while still evolving, has elements of both continuity and change. The worldview is underpinned by a link between economic growth and a projection of power abroad. Modern India is aware of President Roosevelt's maxim of speaking softly while carrying a big stick. Yet her leaders have demonstrated a preference for high words instead of quiet actions. India's economy has tremendous potential, and there's a huge demographic dividend waiting to be harnessed. The fact that the country has existed for millennia, however, creates a certain hubris and a belief that in the end, in the final analysis, India will go on. So why bother with building a new framework for global engagement and international leadership when the legacy is massive enough to just muddle on? India's success as a 21st century world leader depends on jettisoning this way of thinking and embracing the vision of an India that acts like a bigger power or a great power, not simply talks like one. Thank you. So friends, uh, you'll all agree that uh, we've had a very engaging uh, discussion uh, preceded by an equally engaging talk. Now, I have not read uh, the entire book, which came to us only yesterday, but I'm sure that uh, it's a book that explains the evolution of India's foreign policy in in a very uh, in a very contemporary way and it's it's really needed for all of us to know how our foreign policy has uh, has evolved and especially to know that there is a certain continuity because continuity is somehow de-emphasized in the overall debate uh, some of our pioneers of foreign policy are, uh, are dismissed as being irrelevant and certainly in our domestic policy, uh, you know, the conclusion today is that they, ro they don't matter at all and so much so that uh, on the for the 50th anniversary of the Bandung Conference. Uh, the Chinese president went, Indian Prime Minister didn't, didn't go, even though Bandung was a joint enterprise of Nehru and Chu and Lai. So my own, uh, my own take friends is that all of us should pay more and more attention to foreign policy. In fact, circumstances are forcing us to do so with all that's happening in our immediate neighborhood, including the most recent development that uh, brings China, Bhutan, India together. So we have to pay more attention. Foreign policy, like defense policy, is too important to be left to generals in the case of wars and to diplomats in the case of foreign policy. All of us have a stake. And in order for us to discharge our respons responsibility better, we should be guided by scholars like Aparna Pandey. So let's give her a big hand.
Thank you. Sir, to hand the chalka to uh, Dr. Pandey. Friends, you know, it's uh, wrapped in a box, so you, you won't know what it is, but it is a charkha. So, charkha philosophy should guide our development and also our foreign policy, at least this is my conviction. Uh, on that very positive note, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pandey, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Pandey, uh, Sir, Vilkani Sir, Emi Pandey, Emi Pandya, uh, <laughs> for her uh, relentless and uh, work for uh, the event organizing, and all the other staff members of Observer Research Foundation Mumbai, and the audience. Uh, the range of questions were extremely impressive. Thank you so much for patient hearing. See you all.